Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Vessel Church. I am so excited to be here this morning. Uh, so honored to be able to share with you some things that God has put on my heart. And as we concluded the training for victory last week, uh, you know, just thinking about all the ways that we can implement the things that Danny had shared over those weeks, that Cam had shared two weeks ago. And, um, you know, I was reading through uh, Mere Christianity again uh, and when I was taking a trip recently. And this quote from C.S. Lewis really inspired this message today uh, because it got me thinking about how we can have two types of pretense in our life, right? And rather than trying to put it in my own words, I'm just going to read directly from a little uh, quote of his. Uh, And he says, what is the good of pretending to be what you are not? Well, even on a human level, you know there are two kinds of pretending. There's a bad kind where the pretense is there instead of the real thing as when a man pretends he is going to help you instead of really helping you. But there's also a good kind where the pretense leads up to the real thing. When you're not feeling particularly friendly, but you know you ought to be. The best thing you can do very often is to put on a friendly manner and behave as if you were a nicer person than you actually are. And in a few minutes, as we have all noticed, you will will be really feeling friendlier than you were before. Very often, the only way to get a quality in reality is to start behaving as if you already had it. And I love that quote because it puts into context, it puts those two examples before your mind, right? There's a bad kind of pretense where we pretend that we're going to do something without ever actually having the intention of do some, doing it, right? Like C.S. Lewis said, you know, the person who says he would help you but doesn't, right? The friend who always says, I'll help you move. But come moving day, someone just always has something else going on. Or the good kind of pretense where you see what you want, right? You know where you want to be. And in order to get there, you have to kind of trick yourself into feeling that way anyway. You know, I I love, there's like an old sales tactic, right? Where it says like, smile when you answer the phone because people can hear your smile through your voice. You know, I think it's really interesting, uh, even when you're like, recording a voicemail or something like that, it really does change the inflection. But even if you're not feeling up to doing whatever you're doing, putting on that face can help you get to that point. And not to the sense that we're trying to deceive or or, or fool anybody, but that we have a goal in mind, right? That we're focused. This is where we want to be. We're not there yet. So what do we have to do to get there? We have to start acting like the person we want to be there and watch ourselves change, right? And I think that's so applicable to us as Christians. You know, Paul said it perfectly in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 11, verse 1. He says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. You know, it's this great chain of command. It was, he was trying to help the, the church in Corinth be like, look, look at my example here and now. See me in the flesh acting this way and imitate that so that you can become more like Christ. Paul's not saying that he was Christ. He's not saying that he's on an equal playing field or level as Christ. He was saying, no, I am aspiring to be like Jesus. So come with me, imitate me as I imitate Christ. And together, we'll get a little bit closer each and every day. You know, I think about even myself, right? Becoming a worship pastor here at the church. You know, there there wasn't a a moment in time where, um, you know, I had uh, auditioned for the worship team. And then the next day I was like, all right, I'm ready to go. Let's do this thing. I feel like the best I could ever be. I am at the pinnacle of my worship leading career. No, no, I, I wanted to be the best worship leader I could be. I wanted to be the best example I could be. So I had to learn from the people around me who did it best. I had to seek out counsel and help and examples of people that were doing it better than I can. And then learn from that over the years. You know, my job as a worship leader is is not to just stand on stage and, and perform or sing. It's to usher people into the presence of God. It's to help them get an ex- have an experience to be able to connect with our Heavenly Father. It's to help even each and every one of you to deepen your relationship with God. And I can't do that unless I'm always focused on growing and learning with the goal of being the best that I want to be for God. But I also can't, on a Sunday or a praise night, stand up here and, and talk about all the things that I'm not because that would be distracting from my purpose of being here. Instead, I have to have the pretense of where I want to be and work towards that. 
so that hopefully at the end of my worship leading career or the end of my life, I can look back and say, I constantly grew, never being perfect, but always trying to be better than I was the day before so that I could be a better worship leader, so I could be a better Christian, so I could help others come to know Jesus. I know Galatians chapter three um, says it this way, but the scripture imprisoned everything under sin's power so that the promise might be given on the basis of faith in Jesus Christ to those who believe. Before this faith came, we were confined under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith was revealed. The law then was our guardian until Christ so that we could be justified by faith. But since that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For through faith, you are all sons of God in Christ Jesus. I'm going to say that again. For through faith, you are all sons of God in Christ Jesus. And this last part is so important. For those of you who were baptized into Christ have been clothed with Christ. There is no Jew or Greek, slave or free, male or female, since all of you are one in Christ Jesus. Man, it, I love how Paul says it. You know, it, it's being a Christian is on par with being a son of God. But when we really think about that, when we strip it all away, could we ever really be Jesus? We have the scripture which helps us. And we have Jesus' example, his life, his sacrifice, which makes the way for us. But we can never truly be perfect as human beings. We can try all we may want. And hopefully we do grow more and more like Jesus each and every day. But we can never be Jesus Christ. And yet the goal here, the pretense as Christians is that we are sons of God, that we are one with Jesus. The whole idea being that our identity, our hope, our security, and our confidence is found in Jesus. That everything we do, there is no more title. There is no more Jew or Greek. There is no more slave or free. There is no male. or It is just sons of God. It is children of God of God in Christ Jesus. And I think this, this idea can be overlooked and at the same time a lofty goal, but one that as we put on the pretense of being a Christian, having the pretense to prevail, we can become more and more like Jesus each and every day. And hopefully at the end of our days, we are much more like him than we were when we started our journey of following Christ. You know, I think about uh, a, a kid who, who wants to be a professional basketball player, right? And he wants nothing more than to be like Steph Curry and just to drain threes all day, right? But he never actually picks up a basketball. How could he ever get closer to being like Steph Curry if he doesn't put in the work? Like Mack had shared last week about that training that's so necessary, right? You can't expect to become something if you don't take that first step. And under that pretense, there's really those two options, right? Or again, versus the kid who, who wants to be a professional basketball player and, and trains tirelessly each and every day. He may never make it there, but he's going to get much closer under that pretense that he is working towards that goal, working towards becoming a professional basketball player, right? So to quote C.S. Lewis, there's two kinds of pretense. There's the bad kind and the good kind. But to put it in my own words, I would say this. If we pretend with the intention of achieving, we are setting goals. But if we pretend with the intention of deceiving, we're selling our souls. 1 John 1 verses 5 through 10 say this. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light and there is absolutely no darkness in him. If we say we have fellowship with him, and yet we walk in darkness, we are lying and are not practicing the truth. If we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. 
If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. That's the bad pretense. The bad kind is pretending with the intention of deceiving. Because if we're not growing to be more like Christ, we're moving further away from him. And if we say we have no sin, as John writes here, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. So to assume or to pretend that we are working towards being like Christ without taking the actions that we need to to get there, we're fooling ourselves. And we may fool some people around us, but we are not fooling God. You know, I think about the fact that nobody really wants to be fooled. You know, when you think about somebody pulling a trick on you, right? Maybe it's a prank and it's lighthearted and you can laugh, but maybe it's a cruel prank. Maybe it's, maybe it's somebody being downright fraudulent or deceitful to you. I mean, it's no wonder we have laws in this country that say it's fraud to practice medicine without a license to be a doctor. Or the fact that it's first degree criminal impersonation to pretend to be a, a law officer without a badge. Or what's so rampant in this world today is the federal crime to steal someone's identity. I mean, there are industries, there are Fortune 500 companies that were created to protect us against identity theft. Nobody wants to be fooled. Nobody wants to be taken for a fool. So why is it okay to say that we're a Christian and yet not walk as Jesus walked? Why is it okay for us to put on that face to act or to, to post about or to wear a t-shirt or to have a piece of jewelry that denotes that we're a Christian, but our intentions are never to truly change inside. It's just to yield the fruit of whatever that outward appearance may bring. You know, 1 John 2, 6 says that the one who says he remains in him should walk just as Jesus walked. So if you call yourself a Christian and you're not perfect, that's okay. You don't have to be. Jesus never called us to perfection. He called us to humble submission. He called us to repentance. He still calls us to those things. But if you call yourself a Christian, and yet you're still ongoing in unrepentant sin, that's an entirely different notion. That would be the pretense with the intention of deceiving. That would be the pretense that leads us further away from Jesus, that leads us further away from who we say we may want to be. And there are some scary passages in the Bible about exactly that idea. I mean, when I read through 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 7, right? I encourage you to go read it yourself. But it, it, it talks about how there'll be hard times in the later days, right? There are people who are lovers of self, proud, disrespectful, ah. I can't say I have to look very hard to find those qualities in people. But it goes on to say that they will be having a form of godliness, but denying its power. And that they will always be learning, but never coming to a knowledge of, a, of the truth. And I think that is something to be weary of. That is something to be, to, 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 to if I can, warn you of. To not fall subject to that pretense that has the intention of deceiving. Because we can read all we want. We can, we can talk the talk. We can do all that. But unless we're taking the steps, again, like Mac had shared last week, we are under the pretense of being a Christian, but with the intention of deceiving others. And that is not what the gospel preaches. Right? Matthew 6 talks about not being able to serve two masters. And Jesus says that you can't serve God and money. Right? Right? But I don't believe he was just saying money is the only sin. As long as you don't serve money, you're good. I think Jesus was trying to make the point that although money for those people was becoming a God to them, anything that comes before God it could be your master, right? We could have our job as our master. We could have an influence or, or, or a hobby as our master. Anything that comes before God is sin. It's idolatry. We're called not to have any gods before him. 
And Jesus said it very clearly. He says, you cannot serve two masters. The one master is saying that you can be a Christian, but you've got to put in the work. You've got to take the steps. You've got to have the heart that wants to be led to become more and more like Christ. The other one says, you can say all you want, keep living the life you want. It's all fine by me. And when you think about it, Satan loves the fact that people want to call themselves Christians and not actually change who they are fundamentally. He loves the fact that he can deceive people into thinking that they're okay without actually taking the steps towards repentance. Because those examples are the ones that people talk about when they talk about church hurt. That bad kind of pretense is what has led, I'm sure some of us in this room, to doubt our faith at times. That pretense is what continually leads people astray when they say, oh no, that's not for me. Oh, I, I grew up, I, I know what that's about. That is not the message, that is not the love, that is not the mission that Jesus had charged the 11 disciples with on the mountain in Galilee that day. Or later in that same chapter, Matthew's, or I'm sorry, the next chapter, Matthew 7, when Jesus talks about how narrow the gate and difficult the road that leads to life. I know we want to think that Jesus came to just love up on everybody and give everybody a happy life with no consequence and no difficulty. But he said right in that message that he did not come to bring peace, but a sword. Jesus came to shake up the dust of the stagnant and repugnant faith that had no effect on life as a whole. It was a hobby. It was a social circle. It was not a way of life. And it surely wasn't glorifying God or we wouldn't have needed Jesus to come die for our sin in the first place. Later on in Matthew 7, he says, not everyone that says, Lord, Lord, on that day will enter the kingdom of God. And he was talking about people who, who, who aligned themselves with Jesus, who, who, who drove out demons, right? Who prophesied in his name, but whose hearts were far from him. Their intention was not that of becoming more like Christ. And again, you may fool yourself, you may fool those around you, but like Galatians 6 says, God cannot be mocked. For what you sow, you will also reap. Now, I think about my own pretense. Prior to really finding my faith, really finding Jesus, I fell in the pool of the bad kind. I aligned myself with Christianity. I, you know, I read the Bible. I, I, I went to youth group. I would do the summer camps and all that good stuff. You know, but I would act one way in a certain situation and then entirely different based on the people that I was around. You know, Christianity was a convenience. It was not a way of life for me. And, you know, I'd be reading constantly, like it talks about there in 2 Timothy 3, but never coming to a knowledge of the truth. Never really allowing the word to impact me and to change me from the inside out, to make that lasting change. Comparing myself to others, but not comparing myself to what Jesus is calling me to, to that sonship with Christ, to that example of us being children of God, to being like Jesus. And the more I understand that, the further that destination feels. But amen for, for the ability to grow each and every day. Amen for forgiveness for our sin, that we can overcome these things, and Jesus made the way. You know, as we just read in Galatians 6, it, it says that you sow what you reap. You know, and I think about, again, my own personal life. I sowed deceit and I reaped confusion. I sowed deceit in the sense that I put an image forth that I wanted to be, but I didn't really have the intention of making those changes. It was more of, again, this is the person that I'd like to be, but I don't want to have to go through any difficulty to get there. I don't want to have to give anything up in order to be that person that I want to be. I'm just going to say that's who I am and continuing live, continue living my life the way that I already am. And what it led to was confusion in myself, confusion in my relationships. I mean, when you don't really know who you are, how can you then be that person for somebody else? And I know for me, 
always constantly ebbing and flowing and, and changing based on the circumstances. You know, it could be a good thing. You can fit into many groups of, of people, but you can get lost in yourself. And that's ultimately where you will end up. Speaking from experience. You know, when I think about what John was trying to say here in 1 John 5, right? If we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. If we say we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. He's saying, look, it's not about being perfect. It's about being honest. It's about being real. It's about being raw with the fact that we will never be Jesus. We will never get there. But if we stay in the light and stay in that fellowship, we can help each other along that narrow road that is difficult. We can help each other through those hard times, through the things that maybe we don't understand for ourselves. We can help each other to stay on that path, which leads to sowing honesty and reaping righteousness. If we pretend with the intention of achieving, we are setting goals. We are setting a goal for where we want to be. If we pretend with the intention of achieving, it's like C.S. Lewis said, we stand in one place, we say, I want to be a nicer person. You start acting that way, sure enough, before you know it, you are in fact there. But if we pretend with the intention of deceiving, we're selling our souls to the enemy. We are creating a false pretense of what it means to be a Christian. And I warn you against these things. It leads to deceit and confusion for yourself and for others around you. Now, I want to talk about the good kind of pretense. I want to talk about the kind of pretense that can help us on our way, that can help us no matter where we are today, no matter what we're going through, even if we've aligned maybe with the bad type in the past, we can have a fresh start. We can start today with the good pretense, with the intention of achieving. Let's look at Acts 9, verse 19. This is Saul's conversion. And right before this, Paul, who was previously called Saul, was said, he was, was referred to as one who breathes threats and murder. All right? So just keep that in mind as we're reading about who this man become, became in a very short period of time. Acts 9 verse 19 reads this way. Saul with the, was with the disciples in Damascus for some time. Immediately, he began proclaiming Jesus in the synagogues. He is the son of God, is in quotations. That's what Paul was saying in these synagogues. He was using his own Jewish leverage, that knowing that any man of Jewish standing could go preach in the synagogue. He was going in there and preaching this new gospel, right? But didn't we just read about Saul? You know, if you go back through and read Acts 9 in its entirety, you'll see there at the top, it says that he was breathing threats and murder towards these same people who now he's preaching with, right? Verse 21 reads, all who heard him were astounded and said, isn't this the man in Jerusalem who is just causing havoc for those who called on his name and came here for the purpose of taking them as prisoners to the chief priests? But Saul grew weak and meek and, and he fled and he was confused about who he wanted to be. No, no, that's not what it says. It says, but Saul grew stronger and kept confounding the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. After many days had passed on, the Jews conspired to kill him. But Saul learned of their plot, so they were watching the gates day and night, intending to kill him. But his disciples took him by night and lowered him in a large basket through an opening in the wall. I mean, if you want to talk about somebody who had pretense with the intention of achieving, it's, it's Paul, all right? This man, in a matter of days, goes from somebody who was known throughout the countryside as a murderer of Christians to becoming one of the most powerful saints for the mission of Jesus. How could he have done that without having it on his heart of where he wanted to be? I mean, I have to imagine in those moments, right after he realized who Jesus was and what this meant for his life, he didn't feel like the man who was going to write letters that we would read thousands of years later. I can't imagine that he felt like the person who would change this scope of religion, who would take this message, this gospel, and make it known throughout all the regions around Damascus. But yet, he had the pretense with the intent of achieving. 
And every day he grew stronger in his faith. Every day he grew stronger in that message, knowing who he was and what he stood for. He didn't wait for the dust to settle. He didn't wait for people to forget about that Saul, that murderer guy. He acted immediately. It says immediately he began proclaiming Jesus in the synagogues. Immediately. You know, and I know sometimes we can feel like, well, if I was in Paul's shoes, I probably, if I had that type of conversion where Jesus, you know, made me blind and then healed me of my blindness, I would probably be pretty bold too. You don't want to be in Paul's shoes. Paul was a murderer. Paul was taking lives of people that he would then call his brothers and sisters. You don't want that burden. I don't know firsthand, but I have to imagine that he carried heavy guilt for his life. Even though he knew Jesus forgave him of his sins, he had to remember all those people that he persecuted for doing what then he would go on to do and die for. So the next time you read a passage in the Bible, you think, well, you know, they were with Jesus, so it must have been so easy. No, it wasn't so easy for them. They had their doubts too. They had their struggles too. But they acted under the pretense that they wanted to be more like Jesus. And at the end of their days, they all shared similar deaths to he. That's not a place that I want to have to be. But I'm happy that I can learn from that and that I can also, in, the, in a place like the USA, exercise freedom of religion and share that freely with others, knowing that I myself am not perfect, but I will work each and every day to be more and more like Jesus. You know, it makes me think about uh, a friend of mine who is aspiring to be a luxury leather goods maker. And my buddy Dame, he's, he's you know, under this pretense that he wants to have the first like luxury leather brand out of Buffalo, New York, has taken the steps and, and had to pay some serious costs and, you know, not cutting corners, not cheapening his products, but selling a genuine luxury good. Even though the brand isn't established yet, he's, he has the pretense of achieving that goal, right? And I believe that he will make it there because he's, again, not cutting corners. There's no, there's no ifs, ands, or buts. That's the focus that he has. That's where he wants to be. And his pretense is that I'm going to achieve this goal. I'm going to be a luxury goods maker out of Buffalo, New York. And each and every day, each and every week, I see him step his game up a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more. And it just, it's so encouraging to see. And that's just from a, a business standpoint. You know, I think about my friend Lucas, who, who not long ago we were studying with and helping him come to faith himself. And I remember him saying, you know, I want to be at a place in my faith where I can help others, where I can share scripture, where I can know how to handle a given situation. And I've watched him you know, study diligently and, and go after his relationships and friendships and strive to be like those people that he said he wanted to be like. Ultimately, like Paul says, as they imitate Christ. And now seeing him in different situations and, and watching him handle, you know, people's questions and concerns or addressing sin in people's character and helping them to see what their life looks like in comparison to what the Bible says. And it's so encouraging because I see that good pretense. I see him aspiring towards that goal, right? Wanting to be at that place, even though maybe he's not there yet, but working towards it each and every day. And that's what it's about for us as Christians. It's not about perfection. It's about looking at who Jesus is and where he is and the example that he set and taking one step every minute, every day, every week, every month, every year towards being more like him and then seeing what comes of that faith when we proceed under the good kind of pretense? So what will our faith produce in a month, in a year, in a decade? Will we be able to look back and see all the goals that we set and maybe achieved or are still working towards? Or will we be still confused about why we're not where we wanted to be in the first place when we set on that journey? Because if we pretend with the intention of achieving, we're setting goals. But if we pretend with the intention of deceiving, we're selling our souls. Now, as I think about 
those disciples and, and, and the pretense that they must have had on their hearts, right? Just shortly after Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, he calls them to the mountain of Galilee. And we're going to pick up here in Matthew 28 as we prepare ourselves for communion. It reads, The eleven disciples traveled to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped, but some doubted. Jesus came near and said to them, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. You know, it said that some doubted. But those 11 men, some of which who doubted, left that mountain and took charge of the mission that Jesus had called them to. Now, as you read through the Gospels and you read through the Acts of the Apostles, you see that the story doesn't stop here. Those men who doubted don't stop at doubt. They proceeded under that pretense that they would be exactly who Jesus was calling them to be. And they achieved that over the course of their lives. Not without mistakes, as you'll read how even Saul, who now is named Paul, has to challenge Peter, who was the one who had, was given the keys to the kingdom. He had to challenge him on his own walk. You know, So not without their own fair share of mistakes, obviously still being human, but under the pretense that they are working towards becoming more like Jesus every single day. You know, I think about the, the scene of the 11 guys sitting up on this mountain just days after all of this crazy confusion happened. Jesus is crucified on a cross. And then they hear that the tomb is empty. And then he appears to them. I mean, what a wild weekend. But at the end of it all, they're able to walk off this mountain understanding that Jesus is calling them to something far greater than they imagined just a week earlier. That his whole point, his purpose, his mission was not what they thought it was as he was being led to the cross. But now, understanding what they were being called to, coming down off this mountain, after seeing the risen Jesus, understanding that the mission before them is to help others become more like Christ. That the mission before them, that the, the message that they were told to take charge of, to observe means to keep or to guard. The, the mission that they were entrusted with was to help every single person that they came in contact with to understand who Jesus was, why he came, and what he has to offer for them. And thank God for his sacrifice. Because without it, we could not even begin to imagine being called sons of God. Without it, we wouldn't know what it looks like to selflessly give to this extent. But in light of Jesus' sacrifice, we have something that we can hold on to, something that we can focus on, especially when we have moments of doubt, especially when we feel like we can't amount to anything more than maybe we are today. But understand that Jesus has gone before you, he is with you now, and he will always be with you through anything that we're going through. This risen Jesus means that nothing is impossible for God. This risen Jesus means that even if your pretense may not have had the purest intentions, even if your life to this point isn't what you want it to be, there is so much more that God can put before you. There's so much more that he can do with you and wants to do with you if you trust in him and take those steps and come before him with that humble adoration. If you come before him with a heart ready to repent, ready to have fellowship and live in the light because those are the qualities of the good kind. And I hope everyone here wants to follow in those steps. Let's go to God in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for all that you do, Lord. 
for all of the ways that you intercede for us, for all the ways that you protect us and guard us and love us, God, for the sacrifice of your son on the cross, for the example that he shows through his love, through everything that he gives. God, I pray that we would always come back to the foot of the cross, always reflecting on Jesus' great sacrifice, understanding that there is nothing that you won't do to have fellowship with us, God. But it is our choice. It is up to us to take that narrow path that may be difficult at times, that may not always be comfortable, but that yields this amazing relationship with you, that yields this amazing life of becoming more like your son each and every day. We love you. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Hey guys, thank you so much for tuning in with us today. I'm so excited uh, to be able to take this stuff into our weeks, to be able to go forward with a good kind of pretense, with the intention to achieve. Let's set some goals for Jesus. Let's think about who we want to be in light of who he is. And let's go out there. Let's make this world a better place. We love you guys. Have a great Sunday. Guys, thank you so much for joining us for service here today at Vessel Church. We have service every Sunday at 11.30 a.m. and we hope that you continue to watch and be inspired with us. If you're looking for new ways to get involved in your faith or just with Vessel Church, you can go to our website, vesselchurch.org, where we have all of our events, all of our times, dates, and if you're not in the Buffalo area, we even have links to more social media where you can get in touch with some of our worship music, whether it be covers or originals, so that you can deepen your relationship with God. We love you guys. We hope that you have a great week. And as always, go Bills.